sometimes when we go through suffering as believers, we have this tendency to think that it's a result of our own sin. And while there may be seasons that sin brings on suffering, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's just because we live in this fallen world, this world full of sin. And that doesn't mean that God isn't present with us when we go through that suffering. It doesn't mean that sometimes I think if we've had victory in other areas of our lives, we, we have this tendency to turn inward and, and think that God has removed his favor or his blessing from us when really that's not the case at all. If we look through this filter of God's unfailing love, we can recognize that even in the midst of suffering and the suffering because of the world that we live in, that he is present and he, he loves us through all of those seasons. So I pray today is a blessing to help you understand that a little bit better. Hey friends, welcome to the Hearing Jesus podcast. Do you sometimes doubt if you're truly hearing God's voice or if it's really your own? And how do you know the difference? Do you ever struggle to feel confident in your relationship with God and what He says in His Word? Do you sometimes feel stagnant or like maybe you hit a wall in your spiritual life? Hey, I'm your host, Rachel Grohl, missionary, author, pastor, and life coach, and I have been there. I too was doubting God's voice in my own life. I felt insecure about my relationship with Him, and I wanted to be obedient to what God was calling me to do, but I wasn't quite sure how to figure out what that was. I felt like I was wasting time trying to figure it out, and I just wanted a way to understand His will for my life. The answer for me was found in the pages of the scriptures, as I learned how to understand what they were actually saying. If you're ready to grow in your faith and to step confidently into the calling God has for you, then join me as we dig deep into God's Word so that you can learn to live out your faith in your everyday life. Hey friends, welcome to the Hearing Jesus Podcast. Do you sometimes doubt if you're truly hearing God's voice or if it's really your own? And how do you know the difference? Do you ever struggle to feel confident in your relationship with God and what He says in His Word? Do you sometimes feel stagnant or like maybe you hit a wall in your spiritual life? Hey, I'm your host, Rachel Grohl, missionary, author, pastor, and life coach, and I have been there. I too was doubting God's voice in my own life. I felt insecure about my relationship with him, and I wanted to be obedient to what God was calling me to do, but I wasn't quite sure how to figure out what that was. I felt like I was wasting time trying to figure it out, and I just wanted a way to understand his will for my life. The answer for me was found in the pages of the scriptures, as I learned how to understand what they were actually saying. If you're ready to grow in your faith and to step confidently into the calling God has for you, then join me as we dig deep into God's Word so that you can learn to live out your faith in your everyday life. Hey friends, welcome back to the Hearing Jesus Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Grohl. Today we're going to be reading from Psalm 44. We have heard with our ears, O God, our fathers have told us what you did in their days in days long ago. With your hand you drove out the nations and planted our fathers. You crushed the peoples and made our fathers flourish. It was not by their sword that they won the land, nor did their arm bring them victory. It was your right hand, your arm, and the light of your face, for you loved them. You are my king and my God who decrees victories for Jacob. Through you, we push back our enemies. Through your name, we trample our foes. I do not trust in my bow. My sword does not bring me victory, but you give us victory over our enemies. You put our adversaries to shame. In God, we make our boast all day long, and we will praise your name forever. But now you have rejected us and humbled us. You no longer go out with our armies. You made us retreat before the enemy and our adversaries have plundered us. You gave us up to be devoured like sheep and have scattered us among the nations. You sold your people for a pittance, gaining nothing from their sale. You have made us a reproach to our neighbors, the scorn and derision of those around us. You have made us a byword among the nations. The peoples shake their heads at us. My disgrace is before me all day long and my face is covered with shame. At the time of those who reproach and revile me because of the enemy who was bent on revenge. All this happened to us, though we had not forgotten you or been false to your covenant. Our hearts had not turned back. Our feet had not strayed from your path. But you crushed us and made us a haunt for jackals and covered us over with deep darkness. If we had forgotten the name of our God or spread out our hands to a foreign God, would not God have discovered it since he knows the secrets of the heart? Yet for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. 
Awake, O Lord, why do you sleep? Rouse yourself, do not reject us forever. Why do you hide your face and forget our misery and oppression? We are brought down to the dust, our bodies cling to the ground. Rise up and help us, redeem us because of your unfailing love. In Psalm 44, the psalmist believes that God's people are suffering and being defeated because God has abandoned them. I mean, we see this through verses 9 through 16, but yet he's confused. So he can find no evidence of sin or rebellion that would account for God's rejection. And in fact, the people have remained faithful. And so they have obeyed God's laws and they've kept their hearts pure. And the psalmist personally is relating to the experience of godly people who live right by God's standards, but still experience a lot of difficulty and a lot of really hard times. And it can seem like God is no longer with them. And there's even, um, you know, some of this that we see when, when we read about the story of Job. The answer to that experience that is very common to a a lot of people is found in verse 22. It says, yet for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. When it says, for your sake, we face death all day long. The Holy Spirit reveals that one of the reasons that God's faithful people will be experiencing suffering is because they live in a world that is hostile towards God. We live in a world full, a fallen world full of sin. And so the Apostle Paul, um, which, you know, later we read about Paul in the New Testament, he's essentially a, a, a missionary and a leader in the early church. He cro- quotes this verse when he's talking in Romans chapter 8, verse 36. And his purpose is to teach us that anybody who identifies with Christ and refuses to conform to the world and ungodly practices and lifestyles of the world, they're go- we're going to face this opposition. We're going to experience this this backlash, so to speak. And there's going to be persecution and there's going to be suffering. Yet God's people are assured of victory because of their faith and their relationship in Jesus. And so there's no adversity that can separate us from God's love. So while it may feel that way, and what we're seeing here in Psalm 44 is the emotion behind feeling that way, in actuality, it cannot separate us. The The feeling or the experiences that we're going through, it cannot, ex- it, it cannot separate us from God's love and from the d- victory that we essentially have because of God's love. The reality is, is we live in a fallen world. And so sometimes, even when we have been faithful to God, bad things can still happen to us. And and the best explanation we have for that is because we live in this fallen world of sin. And and it also produces in us this longing for the restoration of the of um God's kingdom on earth later down the road. And we have to always remember too that God acts in a way that is best for us. He does good and he is good. And so while there is this cord of uncertainty sometimes when we're going through those things, we have to remember there's this undertone that God's unfailing love will never leave us, even in the midst of suffering, which is hard to hear, I know, because we want to have this, there's this temptation to think, we want to have this idea that when we become Christians, that life is going to be easy. God does not promise that life will be easy. He promises his, his presence. He promises to sustain us. But the reality is, is we do have suffering sometimes because we are humans and we live in this world. As we read through Psalm 44, what we're seeing here is a, a community lament. And so we've seen laments, which is like a complaint prayer, essentially. We've seen that individually. Um, now we're seeing this as a community. And it's following some of the national defeat of Israel's army. And so even though the psalmist is speaking on behalf of the king, he cannot understand why this has happened because Israel has not forgotten God or been false to the covenant. That's the reality of our situation. Sometimes even when we're faithful, sometimes bad things still happen to us and it's hard for us to understand. And as we live and experience life in this fallen world, there's this sense that um, sometimes we can feel helpless in that. 
But we have to recognize that that is why God sent Jesus, that we can have hope in the midst of our circumstances, that we can have God's presence even when we're suffering. Psalm 44 is a expression of essentially isolation. So um, if we think about what was going on at that time of history, um, God had in the past given the land of Canaan as Israel. Um, and, and that's clear in the psalmist's mind, but his understanding of why God has not kept what he thinks is his part of the promise and secured faithful Israel on their land, um, that's kind of lacking because of his historical knowledge. Theologically, he's he's isolated from the land, quote unquote land, of understanding God's ways. And he's not angry. He trusts God, but sometimes he questions God. And it's not coming from a place of anger. It's really come coming from a place of not understanding. And I've been there. There's been times where in my life I have said, okay, God, I trust you, but I don't understand. And I'm, I'm going to walk through this because you've, this is, this is the path I have. I'm not going to despair from, um, feeling defeated or feeling like, like I messed up in the sense that I know that I didn't mess up and I'm still experiencing this. I'm going to trust you and I'm going to trust you're going to get me through that. I think that this idea of God's unfailing love. And if we're, we're going through things for the sake of God's name, we can get to this place where we can reconcile what we're going through now versus, um, we see this idea later in Romans when it talks about us being more than conquerors through him who loved us. It doesn't mean that there's not ever going to be something to conquer. It, in fact, it, it's pretty predictable that it's quite the opposite, that we are going to face things that feel impossible for us, but we are not doing it alone. And I think that's an important part to remember. I think this is especially hard when we've experienced um, victory in the past. And so what we see at the beginning part of the psalm is just this um, retelling of victories and the way that God has fought on their behalf and really kind of shown up for this nation. And then there's this shift that happens, uh, verse 9, but now you've rejected and humble us. So up through verse 8, this is really a poem that's kind of sounding almost like a victory celebration. But then with verse nine, there's this like perplexing reality that starts to sit in, set in where it's well, but now, but now what's going on, God? And we're, it's talking about how adversaries have plundered us. And so that gives us this picture of defeat since plundering follows, follows defeat. And in 11, it says, you gave us up to, to be devoured like sheep and have scattered us among the nations. It's this picture of defenseless sheep that is trying to elicit maybe some compassion even. And, and the description of the, dis the scattering among the nations is, is borrowed from Leviticus chapter 26, where the Lord is informing Israel of the consequences of disobedience to the covenant. So what we're seeing is like this shift in perspective, which is indicating a shift in circumstances. There's a, a layer of Israel's loyalty that um, the psalmist is saying that they haven't been unfaithful to. And, and I think that's important because I think sometimes we get to a place where we second guess ourselves and we question ourselves. We talked about this before where um, sometimes if there's like suffering or an illness going on, there's a tendency to think that maybe there's some hidden sin that, that we weren't aware of. And while there is definitely consequences to sin in our lives, um, suffering or illness is not always the result of it. And, and so just like sometimes illness is the result of living in a fallen world, sometimes suffering is the result of living in a fallen world. And that doesn't mean it's always your fault. It doesn't even mean it's a consequence of your, of your own sin. Sometimes it's just a consequence of living in this world. And so I uh, appreciate the honesty with how the psalmist is laying this out. And I think what that helps us to understand is 
that we can come to God in those moments. And just because we're experiencing that does not mean that he's mad at us. It does not mean that he's no longer faithful. It does not mean that he's no longer present. Instead, it's a way for us to lean into his presence despite the things that this world throw at us. And we have to remember, just as much as God is at work in this world, we have a very real enemy that is at work in this world. And sometimes we are just victims of the evil of this world that has been set into motion because of original sin. And and yet, um, I think there's encouragement for us here. Because we're able to step back and, and learn from this perspective of still going to God, even when we're frustrated, even when we don't understand, even when we're angry, even when we're feeling um, like he's turned his back on us. We don't want to misplace the blame. I think that's the caution. We don't want to misplace the, the blame for what's going on. And we also don't want to turn our backs on God because essentially that's the only way we're going to get through it. The only way we're going to get to the other side and still have peace and still have hope is by clinging to God in the midst of our difficult circumstances. There's one more thing I want to point out. As we're seeing um, throughout Psalm 44, God is listening to Israel speak, but he himself is not speaking at all. He's just acting. So that's kind of typical of our own lives and our own experiences. Sometimes we see God's actions that don't make sense to us. They defy reason. And we can't even explain it away based on our own sin. And so Psalm 44 does something really unique for us. It lays out this way of resolving that kind of mystery. And the way it does that is that we have to interpret God's actions in terms of his unfailing love. And so, you know, sometimes as parents, we act in terms of our children's best interests. And for them, they sometimes think that we are acting out of selfishness or for our own sake or for our own interests and not their interests. But because they're the child and we're the parent, they see the dot on the paper and maybe some of them see the piece of paper that has a dot on the paper, but we see the house that the paper is sitting in. And, and so I've used that analogy before. If, if you don't, if that doesn't make sense to you, you can go back to listen to different podcasts that explains it more clearly. But basically what I'm saying is that God has the big picture in at stake. And so when, when our view of what we expect or understand of God fails, and we don't seem to hear God speaking into that situation, we have to lay ourselves at the feet of, of God and re- remember that he has a love for us that is unfailing because God is love. First John 4, 8, God is love. God is the same yesterday, today, tomorrow. So if God is love and his love for us, us is unfailing, we can come to this place where even when we cannot understand what is happening in our lives or why things are happening in our lives, especially when it doesn't seem to be related to our own sin, just just like what's going on with Israel right here, we can see a parallel between Israel's dilemma and our dilemma, and we can rest and understand and knowing that God loves us and that he has our best interests in mind, even if we don't understand it even if it feels like um, it's not the right decision or like we've been abandoned, we know that that's not true. And, and so we have to remember that even in the moments we don't understand that God's unfailing love there is there and it's present for us. So given that insight, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to read Psalm 44 again. We have heard with our ears, O God, our fathers have told us what you did in their days and days long ago. With your hand, you drove out the nations and planted our fathers. You crushed the peoples and made our fathers flourish. It was not by their sword that they won the land, nor did their arm bring them victory. It was your right hand, your arm, and the light of your face, for you loved them. You are my king and my God who decrees victories for Jacob. Through you, we push back our enemies. Through your name, we trample our foes. 
I do not trust in my bow. My sword does not bring me victory. But you gave us victory over our enemies. You put our adversaries to shame. In God we make our boast all day long, and we will praise your name forever. But now you have rejected and humbled us. You no longer go out with our armies. You made us retreat before the enemy, and our adversaries have plundered us. You gave us up to be devoured like sheep and have scattered us among the nations. You sold your people for a pittance, gaining nothing from their sale. You have made us a reproach to our neighbors, the scorn and derision of those around us. You have made us a byword among the nations. The people shake their heads at us. My disgrace is before me all day long, and my face is covered with shame at the taunts of those who reproach and revile me because of the enemy who is bent on revenge. All this happened to us, though we had not forgotten you or been false to your covenant. Our hearts had not turned back. Our feet had not strayed from your path. But you crushed us and made us a haunt for jackals and covered us over with deep darkness. If we had forgotten the name of our God or spread out our hands to a foreign God, would not God have discovered it since he knows the secrets of the heart? Yet for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Awake, O Lord, why do you sleep? Rouse yourself. Do not reject us forever. Why do you hide your face and forget our misery and oppression? We are brought down to dust. Our bodies cling to the ground. Rise up and help us. Redeem us because of your unfailing love. God, we thank you for your hand of redemption that helps us and redeems us because of your unfailing love. God, help us to have the same kind of faith as the sons of Korah represent in the psalm, that even when we don't understand, help us to come to you. Even when we can search our hearts and know that there's no sin that has led to the consequence of what we're experiencing right now, God, help us to see things through the filter of your unfailing love, that that we can rest and know that you are the redeemer and restorer of all things. And help us to remember that um, sometimes it's because we live in a fallen world, that there is suffering in this world. And it's not because of discipline and it's not because of distance but it's because of of the way that the enemy has worked in this world and the reason why you had to send jesus to redeem us and restore us in the first place god i thank you for your spirit that is present when we're going through difficult seasons in our of our lives and i thank you that we can look through this filter of your unfailing love that no matter what your love never fails us lord help us to come to you in the midst of our suffering I thank you for the hope and the presence that remains. Lord, I thank you for my friends today, and I pray that you would be with them today and every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey friends, I just want to let you know that we have lots of great resources for you in the She Hears shop. So if you are looking for something to do after you finish the She Hears Bible study, or even if you would like a Bible to go along with the Psalm study that we're doing, we have lots of note-taking Bibles and journaling Bibles. There's kind of something for everyone in there. And a new thing we put in the shop is something I love. I use it with my teenage daughters, is the real pretty Bible books of the Bible markers. So you, they're little tabs you put on the outside of your Bible and they help you easily be able to see and flip to different books of the Bible. It's so helpful like for church or when you're doing a Bible study to easily be able to see where you're going. So I pray all those things are resources that you will find helpful. And again, you can find those at shehears.org on the resources page. Hey friends, if this podcast helped encourage, empower, or equip you for God's call in your life, I would love it if you would head over to Apple Podcasts and leave me a review. That's the number one way you can support my show. You can also join our free Facebook community or Instagram page where I share inspirational tips, resources, and prayer throughout the week. Hey, I want you to know I'm praying for you this week. Know that you are loved, you are cherished, and you are His.